All right guys, so back to work on the tiny house this week and I've got a lot of work to get done this week because my parents are coming into town this weekend. I've been telling them for the last month or so that they would be able to stay in the tiny house when they come visit. So not gonna get the tiny house done this week, but I'm gonna get it livable or at least that's the goal. So the Birkins guys are showing up here in a couple minutes to help with the doors and trim inside. So I'll check back in once they get here. The first thing to get knocked out on day one was installing the trim and doors in the space since we had just wrapped up installing the flooring. For the baseboards on the plywood walls, I decided to just keep things simple and ripped strips of the leftover pre-finished plywood to use as the baseboard. Since these pieces were 8 foot lengths, we needed to cut scarf joints at one end of the boards and this helped to hide the seam between the two boards. It's pretty good. That's how I roll, bub. I also didn't have a miter saw set up in the tiny house just to avoid creating too much dust, which meant we had Jono from the Perkins crew as our remote cut guy using the miter saw up in my garage. So our cut guy is remote on this job. Oh, cut guy hung up on you. Dude, how are we gonna what, get What kind done? of cut guy is that? <laughs> he goes Papa John's. <laughs> All right, guy, I got 28 and... Five-eighths long. After getting the plywood baseboard installed, we needed to add the trim where the two vaulted ceiling panels met up. And before installing those pieces, I went ahead and blacked out the ceiling fan boxes with some black spray paint, which I figured would look a lot better since the lights and ceiling fans are also black. Once that was done, we could get the trim pieces cut. So to make these trim pieces, we ripped a bevel on the back edges of the plywood strips, and this would help the trim pieces meet up cleanly with the angled ceiling panels. And this was a bit of a tricky cut on the table saw, but we ended up with exactly what we needed for the ceiling trim after ripping. To help air seal the trim piece to the ceiling panels, we added a strip of the same weather stripping foam I used when installing the plywood panels originally. And once that was added, we could nail the trim in place. And it was amazing how much better the ceiling looked with that last bit of insulation covered up. And this was really the moment where the tiny house started to look like a finished space to me. We weren't quite done with the ceiling trim yet though, as we also needed to add a few pieces around the edges of the ceiling fan boxes. And those ended up being a total pain to fit. It's only a one version <laughs> job. I need your help. Yeah, it's only one inch long. Before getting the white baseboard installed, we needed to go ahead and install the other two doors in the tiny house. And we started by adding some shims to the hinge side on the rough opening to plumb that side of the door opening. <laughs> you wasted my shims, man. <laughs> this side's a little low. Once that was done, we slid the door assembly into the opening and double checked the hinge side for plumb before attaching it to the wall with two and a half inch screws through the hinge plates. Next, we leveled the top of the door frame by shimming the handle side of the door frame. I mean, that's good. And once that was looking good, we nailed it in place. I mean, that looks pretty good. We continued fine tuning the fit with more shims, checking for an even gap between the door and the jam, all the way around the door. And once we were satisfied, we cut off the excess shims and then slid the other half of the split jam door assembly into place. And the other half got nailed in place and we could match the nail placement on both halves to ensure we were nailing over the shims. We repeated the process on the other door and once it was installed, we <laughs> removed the ugly factory trim with this handy trim puller tool so we could add some square 1x4 trim instead. We left about a quarter inch reveal between the trim and the door jam and nailed it in place around the door. And in retrospect, I wasn't super impressed with the quality of these split jam doors, but they were all I could get in a timely manner in the style I wanted. So we made them work, but I probably wouldn't recommend them if you're looking for a nice door. So now that those doors and most of the trim is installed, we can go ahead and get started on some painting work. This is gonna be pretty time consuming because we gotta paint the doors themselves, the door jams, which are raw wood, as well as the window jams and window frames, which are also raw wood. So we're gonna have a lot of paint dry time between the primer and the multiple coats of paint. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So hopefully we can get this all put back together by the time my parents come this weekend. I got the doors removed from the hinges and set up for painting on day two, and upon closer inspection, I noticed a pretty sizable ding in one of the doors. To fix this, I called upon one of my favorite wood fillers for larger damage like this, Total Boat Fixwood. And Fixwood is an epoxy putty, which means it bonds really well with the wood and dries extremely hard. 
I mixed up a small amount and applied it to the damaged area with my fingers, making sure to leave some excess above the surface of the damage so I could sand it back later. And then I set that door aside so the fixed wood could dry for a few hours. I got the other doors prepped for paint by removing the hinges and giving them a quick sanding to break the edges. And I made sure to cover the new floors underneath the doors to prevent any spills. We started with a coat of primer to make sure the paint bonded well with the bare wood, and Nate rolled on a fairly heavy coat for this initial coat to build the finish more quickly. To prep the door frame for paint, I initially masked off the hinges, but decided to just remove them in the end just to make sure everything got painted well. We also used the same primer on the door jams, and I wasn't worried about covering the trim with this primer since it was already pre-primed. While Nate worked on painting, I started getting the window jams prepped for more paint. I needed to do some sanding to both smooth the edges of the plywood panels and the window openings, but also to clean up any surface stings on the window jams. These jams and the window frames themselves are unfinished pine, so they sanded easily, and this Festool sander has built-in edge guards so I didn't gouge the adjoining jams while sanding the inside corners. I hit the window molding with a little hand sanding and then vacuumed up any dust before masking off the windows. I made sure to mask both the faces of the plywood panels as well as the window glass as I really wanted to avoid any paint cleanup later on. The last window to prep was in the kitchen and this window will be surrounded by the tile backsplash with a Schluter strip installed flush to the window jam. Because of that, I needed to cut back the drywall a bit in this area to account for that Schluter strip before masking off the window glass. With the prep done, Nate got to work priming the window openings and we let the first coat dry overnight before coming back for day three. To kick off day three, I repeated the sanding process on the window frames as the water-based primer raised the grain on the windows and doors. And I also opened the windows to let the tiny house air out a little bit. And as you can see, unfortunately, we couldn't actually open the windows during the painting to hit all of the parts of the frame as it was raining on and off all week. So that'll have to wait until later. I also went ahead and caulked the gap between the plywood panels and the window jams as the paint was having a tendency to run down in this area. And I think caulking the gap made it look better too. While I worked on that, Nate came back and filled all of the nail holes in the trim and the door openings with wood filler. And I like doing this after the first coat of primer as the primer really highlights the nail holes that actually need to be filled. I could also come back and sand down that Total Boat Fix Wood now that it had dried and this stuff sands like a dream and you can't even see where this damage was in the finished door. Nate got the first coat of paint on the doors while I continued caulking and in case you're wondering this color is Sherwin-Williams Cyberspace and I think it looks awesome on these doors. We continued painting for the rest of day three and we could come back for day four to start the mad dash of getting the house put back together. I started by getting the doors hung back up and then I could get the handles installed, which was a pretty simple process. I did need to cut out some of the jam for the strike plate to fit properly. And I like to start this process by installing the strike plate and cutting around its perimeter with a utility knife. I then removed the strike plate and used a chisel to cut out the area I needed. And the scored line from the utility knife helps to prevent chip out from the chisel, which can be pretty bad on soft wood like this pine. And I probably should have done all this work prior to painting, but luckily I got the jams chiseled out without any major damage to the paint and the doors were working well. Next, I could get the window opening hardware installed in these casement windows. And I think this cyberspace color really made these windows pop here inside the house. I could also finally get the masking material that comes applied to the window from the factory removed. And one thing to make sure to hang on to if you're building a house is this Energy Star certification sticker, which the inspector will check for during your final inspection. Once I had that sticker, I could remove the masking material and it's amazing how much better these windows looked without it. Getting all the doors put back together was a huge relief and I really liked the way this paint color turned out. So with that checked off the list, I can move on to another very important thing, lighting. And I've had this kind of temporary job site lighting throughout the house during a lot of the build, but I wanna go ahead and get that swapped out in the bedrooms at least because they're pretty bright and it would not be very soothing when you're trying to go to sleep to have these LEDs blasting you. So let's go ahead and get started on installing the lighting. I'd actually installed these LED accent lights a few months ago, so let's rewind back and see how those went in. 
So I'd initially installed the LED strips by attaching them directly to the trim pieces I had installed with no diffusion, but the resulting light was really bright and didn't look that great since it was shining right at the ceiling panels. To help fix this, I decided to add these 45 degree aluminum mounting channels from Aspect LED, who also make the dotless linear LED strips I used on this install. The channels were a super tight fit in the groove I had routed into these trim pieces, but <laughs> with a little cursing, Damn it. I eventually got them in and then I could add the LED strips. And I think the look before and after is massively improved and these channels really made all the difference. With one half of this room worked out, I could move on to the rest of the house, starting on the other side of the master bedroom. I added one length of the channel to the trim and then started adding the LED strips, and these are the specific strips I used. And as you can see, rather than the little square elements like typical LED strips have, these are one continuous linear strip of light, which looks so much better in this kind of application because you can't see the little squares. I'd run low voltage wire through the walls earlier in this tiny house project, which allowed me to connect this second strip to the first strip on the opposite side of the room, so both strips could run off of one power supply. And I used this mini low voltage junction box connector to securely connect the wires and then tucked everything back in the trim to hide the wiring. I continued running the LED strips until I got to the end of the first channel, and then I could slide on the diffuser, which comes with the channel. I repeated the process for the second half of the lights off camera and the master bedroom was a wrap. I then repeated the same process in the living and kitchen space and the guest bedroom and then I could call the LED strip installation done. So fast forward back to current time and I could get to work on the next bit of lighting, the wall sconces on either side of the bed in the master bedroom. And these sconces are made by Illuminate Vintage and I use their fixtures throughout the tiny house. And these fixtures were really simple to install and came with all of the necessary mounting hardware and even some LED bulbs. As you can see, I installed a switch for these sconces above where the nightstands will be next to the bed, along with an outlet with USB ports for easy charging. Since these plywood walls were already finished, I could also go ahead and get the screwless outlet covers installed. And one tip when installing these types of covers is to loosen the screws which hold the outlet and switch to the box before installing the cover. And this will allow you to get the cover screwed tight to the outlet and switch, and then fine tune the mounting screws to get the plate flush with the wall. I repeated the process of installing light fixtures in the foyer hallway and above the kitchen sink, and then I could move on to the ceiling fans. The folks from Big Ass Fans were awesome enough to provide the ceiling fans I needed throughout the space, and I used their Haiku L fans in both bedrooms and their Haiku fan in the main room. And all of the fans can be controlled with the included remotes or via Wi-Fi, and I also opted for fans with built-in LED lighting. So I've had a Haiku fan in our master bedroom for the last four years and can definitely say that it's the nicest ceiling fan I have ever used. So I was super excited to install the same fans in the tiny house. And the fans are balanced at the factory so they're completely silent and they can push a serious amount of air. They also look amazing and really fit the modern decor of the tiny house. So now that most of the lighting and the ceiling fan installation work is wrapped up, I can go ahead and start installing these smart blinds throughout the space. And you can actually see one set of them here behind me on this big sliding door. I'm super excited to go ahead and get these all installed. So let's get started. So these blinds are made by Smart Wings, and I decided to try these in the tiny house as they offered custom options which aren't available in the IKEA Smart Blinds I've installed previously in our main house. And the price point on these Smart Wings blinds is much more reasonable than Lutron's Serena Shades, which, while extremely nice, can also be prohibitively expensive. The installation process was super simple. I just needed to install a pair of mounting brackets in each window opening and then attach the blinds to the brackets. And each blind came pre-programmed to the included remotes, and they even programmed in the length of the blind based on the measurements I entered during ordering. So I installed blinds with a blackout material in both bedrooms, but opted for light filtering shades in the main room. And these still allow some light into the room, but will help to filter some of the harsh sunlight when the sun is rising and setting. After getting the smaller blinds installed, I could finally move on to installing the massive shades for the big sliding door in the main room. And this was one of the reasons I was so excited to use these smart wing shades as they could be made large enough to cover this giant 16 foot wide opening. These larger blinds installed just like the rest of the blinds, except they had one extra bracket for added support. And once they were mounted, I could try them out and as expected, they worked great. 
And these blinds, in addition to the sliding privacy doors I plan to build for the outside of the tiny house later on, should really give our guests some much needed privacy since these giant sliding doors face our main house. With the blinds installed, I could get them paired to our Apple HomeKit setup for the tiny house, and this was a pretty simple process. And the beauty of having them connected to HomeKit or any other smart home system these work with Google and Alexa is the ability to control the blinds remotely or from inside the house by asking Siri or your other smart home system. Hey Siri, open the living room blinds in the tiny house. Okay, the shades are open. I can also easily schedule their opening and closing, and I can monitor their battery life so I can know when they need to be recharged. Now, I'll link to the blinds I went with in the video description below, and I'd highly recommend them based on my experience so far. So with all that painting work, the lighting work, and getting those blinds installed checked off the list, I think the last thing to get this place livable is some furniture. And in this master bedroom, that's this IKEA Pax closet system, as well as this king bed that I built a few years back. I actually got the first of the IKEA Pax cabinets installed prior to installing the trim so we could butt the trim into the cabinet. So I opted for a 39 inch wide Pax unit for the leftmost cabinet as this would serve as the utility closet with the tankless water heater. And I added two 19 inch wide units to the right to serve as closet and dresser space in this master bedroom. I had initially planned to build these cabinets myself, but since my new shop is still in the process of being built out, I decided to go with these Pax units and I'm really impressed with the quality and I, I think they look great. With the PAX unit set up, I could wrap up the master bedroom by getting the Live Edge King bed I built a few years ago moved into the room, along with the Shushugi Ban side tables, which I also built. And with that, I could call the master bedroom ready for guests. Out in the main room, I got a TV and couch set up in the living room area, and then brought in the walnut bar stools, another old project for the kitchen island. My plumbers also came out to plumb the tankless water heater and kitchen sink, so we officially had hot water in the tiny house. And with that, I could officially call the tiny house done enough for guests. All right, guys, the weekend has come and gone. My parents stayed out here. Also, my brother came out to surprise me and they loved their stay. They were raving about everything and that was a huge, huge relief after doing all of that work to prep for them coming. We are in the home stretch here, have a couple of odds and ends left. Obviously have some painting work to do inside and on the outside of the house and need to get the kitchen wrapped up with a tile backsplash, some appliance installation, and basically just some other little things besides that and we will be done with this thing. Finally, I've been hard at work on the super cut, the like two hour long version of this entire build series start to finish. It's been really fun editing that, kind of taking a trip down memory lane. If you don't want to miss that video and the rest of the videos in the series, go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell. Also, as always, I'll have links to all the tools and products I use down in the video description below. And last, if you want to support me, I sell merch. I have plans available for the tiny house and for a lot of my woodworking projects. And I also have both YouTube members and Patreon set up. So go check those out. All right, thanks for watching y'all. And until next week, happy building.